Well, this is number four in our series, More Than Enough. And the subtitle is When Life Loses Its Sweetness. So then, uh, you know, just by brief reminder of where we've been, uh, God introduced himself to his first covenant partner, Abram, as El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. The first time he reveals himself to a covenant partner, it's as the God who is more than enough, meaning that is his covenant purpose for us. But as we've seen in the Word of God, you know, it doesn't just fall on your head like a ripe apple out of a tree. More than enough is a process, a life process, a progression in covenant life from the land of captivity, captivity being defined as forced conformity to the world around you, where you really seem to have no choice in the things that determine your quality of life. It's forced on you. And of course, that kind of captivity, uh, deliverance can come from that kind of captivity, bring you into the next land which is the wilderness journey of the Hebrews. We're using them as our example of this progression of life because 1 Corinthians 10 told us to, that what we see about them is an ensample or a type uh, of what we as the spiritual seed of Abraham can expect and how we're to live. And so we see deliverance from captivity or force conformity to the world around you. Uh, deliverance brings you into a, what is defined as wilderness, meaning, you know, a place where you begin to know God. You begin to see and sense His presence, know His presence. He begins to work in your life to meet your need. It is a land that you can wander in indefinitely, and many Christians do, the actual journey from Egypt to Canaan, you know, the land of milk flowed with milk and honey, uh, was a fairly short trip. But it took them 40 years, and that generation never even made it. So the wilderness represents a place where oftentimes it seems like uh, there is no progressive change in your life. Same old, same old. You're not going anywhere. You're not able to really do much of anything, you're grateful that God meets your need. And you know, uh, you get to experience his presence uh, on occasion. They got to follow the pillar of cloud and fire, but uh, it's short of the land that flows with milk and honey. The wilderness represents the land of just enough where God will begin to meet your need. He'll do that for you. But then the land that flows with milk and honey, that's abundance. It, you know, it equates in my mind to several passages in the New Testament under our covenant. God who is able to do exceeding abundantly, more than you can ask or think. He doesn't want you just to have enough. And most people are so grateful just to get enough that they don't, they don't really, you know, move any further, press into a a higher place. The thing about the land that God has for you of your more than enough, your land that flows with milk and honey is going to have some giants in it, going to have some wall cities, there are going to be some battles that have to be fought. Depending on the commentary you read, you know, uh, the children of Israel had to fight 24 to 26 battles over a significant period of time in order to make it to their land of more than enough. It simply demonstrates to us that life doesn't fall on your lap just uh, because you love God and believe. It's because you progressively move your life from any form of captivity into an experience of God's presence and His goodness in meeting your needs. But you have to get into the land of more than enough, which is going to require you to fight some battles. It's going to, make an, going to require you to make an effort. The New Testament calls it pressing toward the mark. 
for the prize of the high calling of God. You don't just cruise along or drift along. It's going to be an effort. And a lot of people find it more uh, comfortable just to let the responsibility for their experience of God's provision rest on his shoulders and just stay in the land of just enough. But there is more, the land of more than enough. And this progress of every covenant believer through their life, from captivity to needs being met to more than enough, is also analogous to your growth in faith. We see a lesson in faith in these examples. Of course, being in captivity, it's believing nothing about God, even when you see his hand. It's always finding a rational explanation for what happens in your life, which limits you to a, an experience of natural circumstance in the world that we live in. And who's the God of this world? Satan is. And so that means he has access to manipulate the circumstance of your life when you will not accept truth as being anything uh, that, that can't be understood by the mind of man. And of course, that produces a captivity where lack is always the result. You might say, no, I know a lot of rich men that, you know, they, got, they don't have any lack, uh, but, you know, they're not believers. They're in some form of captivity, obviously. But if you ever have met a rich person who doesn't know God, they never have enough. They may be worth $100 million. They may be worth a billion dollars, but it's never enough. The more they get, the more they want because there is no other goal in life that is, seems to be worth pressing toward to them. But when you're in this place, of, of complete unbelief, really. And the children of Israel were. They had, they had no prophets, nobody to teach them, nothing to go by, no written word. They didn't know anything. And that's why the Lord says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. They were in captivity. But whatever the world pressed upon them. The second level, the wilderness, now you believe when you see. You graduate from not believing to believing when you see something. See something that is miraculous enough to have no natural explanation and you, you believe for a little while. You require frequent encounters with the miraculous to keep your faith on a, a mediocre plane. And of course, you know, um, we're gonna spend some time talking about the wilderness over the next couple of Sundays, and that'll be demonstrated over and over. They'll get a miracle, and then after sometimes as little as three or four days, you know, they're back into a place where they got to see something else. And then they'll praise God and hallelujah and praise the Lord, and then a little bit later, you know, they got to see something else. So we see a progression from unbelief to believing when you see. And God's gracious enough to show you some things because it's better for you to believe even if you have to see first than not to believe at all. And that's what Jesus told Thomas. Uh, but then you go into the land of more than enough. It requires you to believe the Word of God before you see any result, before any of the promises are manifest. You have to believe first, and then your life begins to move into this new arena. It's going to face some resistance, which will simply demand more faith for you, but as you believe what God tells you, regardless of opposition that you encounter, then you make progress into that land, and more than enough will begin to come to pass. So we can use these examples of the Hebrews as, you know, a process of how faith is developed coincidentally with moving into a different area of provision in your life. Today we're going to talk about encountering bitter water. Bitter waters. 
And that's what causes, of course, life to lose its sweetness. Let's look at um, Exodus. We're going to begin reading in verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness to Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Three days from what? This is three days from the miracle of the Red Sea. Most of the previous part of this chapter is given to an account of the celebration that followed the, the miracle of the Red Sea. Three days later, uh, they find no water and they come to Mara, a place called Mara. And they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara, which means bitter. And the people murmured and complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? He cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. I got to stop here for a moment because for the first several years of my walk with God when I got serious about the Word, I'd read the Old Testament and I'd read where it said God put disease upon people and I will not put them upon you if you obey the Word. And I realized, I came to realize through uh, Kenneth e. Hagin's ministry uh, a little bit later that uh, the Old Testament, the King James in particular, but many other translations as well, use the causative sense of all the Hebrew verbs, but they can be equally translated in the permissive sense. And of course, the it's incumbent upon the translators to understand enough about God uh, to put it in the right sense. There are some translations that use the permissive sense. Uh, the Knox translation is one that I've used in the past. And it says, I will not allow these diseases to fall upon you, which fell upon the Egyptians. And so it's, you know, to keep the, the word in context with what we know of God, in the Old Covenant, I mean in the New Covenant as well as the Old, He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And when we learn in the New Covenant that God doesn't tempt with evil, He doesn't cause problems to come your way. He's not the problem. He didn't make the water bitter. The water was bitter when they found it. He made it sweet. Then we can begin to use the right sense of the verb which is the permissive sense. And he's saying he proved them. That means tested them. God always tests us with the Word of God. The test was one of obedience. Are you going to obey the Word? They have a choice, you know. And he says, if you do, then my hand of protection continue to, can continue to cover you from all manner of disease. Unlike the Egyptians. So that's the right way to read this verse. You can't read it in the causative sense and make it match with the God that we see in our covenant. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen. And so at any rate, at this point in verse 27, they came to Elam where where were twelve wells of water and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. God got them past the bitter waters. We'll talk about that momentarily. Uh, but, you know, there are things which I guess I need to make mention of before we move on. And, you know, when we encounter bitter waters on our road, on our road to our promised land, it's important that you notice they arrived at their bitter water following the cloud and the fire. In other words, God led them there. 
And of course, uh, you know, there's some important um, things that you not do, not make any assumptions about. Number one, don't make the assumption that you missed God, that you got out of the will of God just because life loses its sweetness a little bit. I mean, that's not the case because you can follow your cloud, the inward witness of the Holy Spirit, and still come to bitter waters. It's going to be an experience that every human being has with some degree of regularity throughout their life. These moments when life's sweetness seems to leave and in its stead, the bitter taste of disappointment and frustration move in. It's just going to happen. And it'll happen when you're being led of the Lord does not necessarily mean you're out of the will of God. Nor does it mean that he prepared the bitter water for you to chastise you and teach you a lesson. He just told you how he teaches lessons. He said he'll prove you through the word of God. He reveals the word to your heart. And then, you know, if you obey, you experience the blessing. If you don't, you won't. This isn't legalism. This does not come counter to a proper understanding of grace. Now, there is a way to legalistically obey the word, and it does you no good at all. Amen. Legalistically meaning it's one of the religious do's and don'ts that you just got to suck it up and do. You don't want to, but you're going to do it anyway. You're going to do it to show your husband or your wife how spiritual you are, at least today. <laughs> or you do it, uh, you know, to obligate God to do something for you. But it's really not in your heart to do. That's legalism. And that's what, you know, the Apostle Paul got all over the Galatians about. You can't approach the word legalistically. What is the root of scriptural obedience? It is believing. Because when you believe something is going to be the very best thing that you could do, that's what you do if you're a normal human being. There's another way to say it too because Jesus said in the New Testament, if you love him, you'll do what? Obey him. Love is born out of a revelation or faith and his love for you. Knowing how much he first loved you, you know, and believing that produces a love response in you to him. So basically, whether you call it love or faith or both, faith works by love anyway, then you can see that these two things working together, the love of God and the faith in his word, God and his word are one, or what modifies your behavior in this life in a way that keeps it from being legalistic, enables his supernatural divine protection and grace to be manifest in your life. Amen. Preaching a whole lot better than you're responding this morning. These are things that you need to be well settled on. And of course, you know, you got to know that God doesn't prepare bitter water. Let's look at James 1.13 for a minute. This is so important, even though I know most of you have heard me teach this before. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. But it is important that you realize in verse 13 of James 1, the word is very clear about this. Let no man say when he is tempted. That means tested or tried. <laughs> tempted, tested, or tried. Let no man say, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Is sickness and disease evil? Is losing your joy and having to drink the bitter waters of disappointment? Is that something that you would call evil? Yes. It's part of the world that we live in. Is it evil for you not to have enough to pay your bills or put food on the table? Of course it is. That's not coming from God. He says that he doesn't tempt any man with any form of evil. 
Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13 for a minute. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There has no temptation, same word, temptation, test, or trial, taken you, but such is is common to man. A lot of times we feel like we are the only ones that are going through this nightmare we're in, but he said, no, it's common to man. But know this, God is faithful. He'll, he'll not allow you to suffer. He'll not suffer you, meaning allow you to be tempted or tested or tried. Above that, you are able. There are some times he'll take you around what could have been a disastrous circumstance because he knows you wouldn't be able to handle it. We saw that in the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt. Do you remember? I read it last week. He took them the long way around, the Red Sea way around, because he didn't want them to go through the land of the Philistines. They weren't in a place where they could have absorbed the challenge of a confrontation with the Philistines at this point. They would have wanted to go back to, to Egypt. So the pillar of cloud led them around that hard place. Why doesn't he lead us around all of the bitter waters that we might face in life? Because he calls you an overcomer, plainly and simply, but you have to learn to be an overcomer. It is a process of experiencing enough of life to realize. Now, maybe you can get there without ever experiencing anything. Maybe you have a level of faith where you know that you know that you know you're an overcomer. You're already there. Well, when you come to your bitter waters, then, uh, you know, you're not going to murmur and complain. You're going to rejoice because you know you've already been delivered. Amen. But, you know, if you're like most of us, there may be occasions when you experience bitter waters, and so the griping begins. There isn't really any, any faith that you're going to get beyond this, so you pitch your tent at Mara for a while until you learn that you are an overcomer. There is a way. God has made a way where there seems to be no way. That's what he goes on and says in the balance of verse 13. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape. But that way doesn't mean he's just going to show up and lift it off of you. The way, because he's confronting us with the need to live as an overcomer, the way is that when you refuse to drink bitter water, then it'll become sweet. We'll talk more about this momentarily, but this is also reason to spend just a minute uh, looking at James 1, 2. So go back to James again. I'm going to pull out an important point uh, at the end of this dialogue. Verse 2 says, My brethren, and that includes sistren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, tests, and trials, which, remember, are not from God, but it's a part of this fallen world we live in. We're going to encounter bitter water. God will lead us around the more bitter places that we might not be able to get through because he's not going to allow us to be tested more than we can bear. But he's not going to lead us around everything. All we'd wind up doing is going in circles. We need to make it to our destination, which is a land of more than enough. So you'll encounter some bitter waters. And now he says to count it all joy. That's adversity, bitter waters, disappointment, frustration, temptation, test, trials. What's, this, what's it a trial of, by the way? Your faith. It tells us that in the next verse. Knowing this, that the trying 
Same word, same root word. Temptation is a noun, trying is a, well, yeah, it's a verb. Actually, it's a, I forget it now, it's been too long. But it's some kind of participle, I think. But it, it, but it does show action. It is a verb. Uh, but at any rate, um, when you fall into divers' temptations, whoop, you made me lose my place in my message. It's your fault. <laughs> now, okay. Uh, trying, that's what I was getting at. The trying of your faith. In other words, that's what this is all about. These temptations and tests and trials, you remember what we read? He is proving them. He's saying, if you'll obey my word, then, you know, this isn't going to be problematic. If you don't, it might be. Basically, we're being told here that we're going to experience hard places and bitter waters because there's an enemy in the world who is the God of this world who manipulates natural circumstance to bring pressure on your belief system. Hadn't got a lot of time to, to elaborate, but he'll put pressure on your belief system. You'll say, yeah, I believe that if I tithe, God's going to open the windows of heaven. Now, the enemy can't hold back the opened windows of heaven, but he can put circumstantial obstacles in the way. He can delay it. What's he doing? He's putting pressure on what you say you believe. So this is all about the trying of your faith. And the first thing that God says do when you test, taste bitter waters is to count it all joy, to rejoice. He's teaching us how to be overcomers. Thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. Follow us on social media to receive daily encouragement and ministry news. And be sure to come back again soon for our next broadcast. Have a great week, and as always, remember, God wants you to be a winner in every area of life.